Our study this morning is in the 16th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 16, verse 6, Isaiah 16, verse 6. This uh, class is like a, an inner city public school classroom. The, every week the faces change. <laughs> um, we're in the part of Isaiah that deals with Moab. And since there are some who weren't here last week when we talked about Moab, we're going to do some review. But first... Uh, Let's go to God in prayer. And Nick, would you word a prayer for us this morning? Father God, we thank you for another day. We're thankful for the ability to be here this morning. We're thankful for the freedoms we have that allow us to be here. We pray that you would help us as we go into the study to focus on what Bill is teaching, to focus on your word, to take all of our worldly cares and distractions and take them out of our minds. Amen. So to refresh our minds and to review for the benefit of those who weren't here, uh, who haven't been in this class, Isaiah, of course, is um, dealing primarily, or is thus far in the first uh, uh, several chapters, dealing with the um, nation of Israel, but particularly with Judah. Um, he was, uh, Isaiah was contemporary with what other prophets, just to refresh our memory. Hosea was one. Um, what kings were, what notable kings of Judah, uh, were contemporary with Isaiah. Well, um, Hezekiah was one of the most notable kings of, of Jerusalem, of, of the Judean uh, sector of, of Israel. Um, there was um, Ahaz. Well, of course, if you'd look in the first verse of uh, Isaiah, you'll, you'll find those kings. Um, Obviously, Isaiah, or these prophets, have a historical context. I mean, uh, life was going on in Jerusalem. Life was going on in northern Israel. Life was going on in the various countries surrounding um, the, uh, the Jews. Uh, and so there is a, obviously a historical context, which we'll uh, reference here, uh, hopefully, uh, this morning. Uh, but... Specific to Moab, and, and why would God be interested in Moab? I mean, God's focus was on Israel. God's focus was on Judah. But why, why would he be, um, I mean, why, uh, have, why say anything about Moab? Okay, and, and in this case, there was a kinship between Israel and uh, and particularly Judah and, and um, uh, Moab. Uh, but later on, we're going to be talking about Damascus, Damascus, Syria, and God's pronouncement of judgment on De Damascus. Why bother with Damascus? I mean, what, what, what's, what, what's the... Why deal with all these, um, all these countries around about? Influence that they were having, but why else? I mean, did, when, when God chose the people of Israel, did he dismiss all other peoples? Did he just dismiss all other peoples out of hand? He must not have, because he pronounced judgment on these various 
uh, these various countries. Um, but specific to, to Moab, uh, let's just uh, get the, you know, the, the um, um, linear or, or the long time context, the long time relationship between Moab and Judah and, and Israel. Um, Moab was a descendant of Lot, nephew of um, Abraham. Uh, the Moabites um, uh, gave uh, Israel trouble all along. And just from your memory now, uh, what was one of the first encounters that uh, the children of Israel had with the Moabites after uh, coming out of Egypt? Okay, when they were passing the country of Moab, um, the um, Moabite folks invited Israel to their worship of Baal. It was mostly a, a, a female thing. Uh, and, and when they uh, got, you know, connected with uh, the people of Moab, they started to worship Baal. And you remember that drunken, I, well, I said we could probably say it was drunken uh, orgy that they had when they were passing through that area. Um, God destroyed a lot of Israelite folks um, in, in, that, in that particular situation. Well, um, as, we, as, as we think about it then, and as Israel goes into the land of Palestine, uh, there are some other encounters that Israel had with Moab. Can you re think of some other encounters that they had? During the period of the judges, can you think of some, some encounter that they had with? For 18 years, during a period of time, during that period of judges, of the period of judges, for 18 years, the children of Israel were in uh, subjection to the king of Moab. And so, um, uh, God raised up a judge by the name of Uhad, and uh, got uh, rid of that domination. Well, so there was always this, let's say, bad blood between Moab and, and Israel. Then uh, here, Isaiah has been pronouncing judgment on northern Israel and pronouncing judgment on Judah in the future. And now he's pronouncing judgment on Moab. Now, was Isaiah the only prophet that pronounced judgment on, on um, Moab? Jeremiah, who else? Um, well... Who else pronounced judgment? Jeremiah. There were at least uh, there was at least one other uh, prophet that pr uh, pronounced judgment on on um, uh, Moab. Um, anyone think of that one? We'll come to it hopefully here. Um, so Moab was under uh, God had Moab been in his vision here. And, and let's uh, review just a little bit uh, with regard to um, the, the first six verses uh, for the benefit of those that weren't here uh, the last, last week. Um, here in the first part of the 16th chapter, uh, the judgment is uh, so pronounced on Moab 
that Isaiah had pity on them. Um, for it shall, let's look in the beginning with the first, second verse there. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Ammon. Now think of that, that you know, that imagery. Think of the imagery of a, a, a wandering bird cast out of the nest. What, what, what does that uh, what does that tell us? A wandering bird is cast out of the nest. Well, <laughs> confusion. Um, don't know what to do. Hopelessness. Um, just a, a, a tremendous, uh, uh, in tremendous disarray. Now contrast that with what was happening during the uh, encounter that Israel had with Moab when they were about ready to cross or they were headed toward the Jordan to cross over into the, uh, the, the promised land? Contrast that, you know, that, um, uh, you, you know, that, uh, worship, that Baal worship, uh, all, all of that uh, gaiety, all of that um, frivolity, uh, good times, so to speak, you know, humanly speaking. Contrast that with this image here. Was, was quite, a, quite a different story, you see. Well, uh, they were, um, let my now cast dwell with the Moab in verse 4, um, and in, in verse 5, and in, in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David. Now, there was something going on here. There, was some, there, there seemed to be some interaction between um, Judah and Moab, uh, and, and let, let's just think about that in, in terms of what we know about nations, and we know about religious movements and so forth. Do you suppose there was some um, outreach from the, the, the Jews, uh, particularly the religious Jews, and, and the, the Moabs in terms of, of, of trying to get, give Moab some help religiously? Do you suppose there was any, any of that sort of reaction? Or that, short, that sort of action? I think as we read this, there must have been some communication between Israel, or, or particularly Jerusalem and Moab, um, because it says there in verse 5, and, and in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Um, it appears to me that given, you know, Isaiah's, uh, his um, weeping for the Moabites, he was, he had, he had compassion on the Moabites, and it appears to me that there must have been some, you know, outreach there, and it, there, it may have been that some of the, the, the interaction had to do with, you know, uh, you people of Moab need to be uh, returned, you need to come to the, the God of heaven, the God of the Jews, Jehovah God. Um, And, of course, they didn't, um, they didn't do so. Now, um, now let's, let's think about the, the religious situation here. Here's the, the Moabites um, and the Jews, the Jews relating to Jehovah God, the Moabites relating to uh, a... Um, false god 
or false gods. Now, in, in that situation, um, could there have, could there, have, could there be any compromise between the God of the Jews and the gods of the Moabites? Could there have been any compromise? Somebody said no. No. There couldn't have been, which is really, you know, a, a lesson for America. The Moabites would have had to accept the God of heaven, Jehovah God, with no compromise, period. Now, the uh, yesterday I passed by a Muslim uh, building uh, right here in our community, uh, and, and in, in fact, there were more cars there <laughs> in that. No, it was on a Friday. There were more cars in that lot than there are in El Cairo Road's lot. Okay. Now, um, we have a movement in this country that says, you know, the, the, oh, the children of Abraham, uh, those that look to Abraham need to come together in some kind of a, you know, some kind of a uh, communion, okay? How would that work? Okay, but on one of the college campuses in Rochester, uh, Michigan, used to be a Christian college, a group of people came together, uh, Jews, Muslims, and so-called Christians came together to um, have a, I don't know, some kind of a meeting discussion, so forth. Now, uh, how's that going to work? Mark says, it's not going to work. Well, you see, things in society affect the church, right? Society affects the church. So, there might be some people in the church starting to think, well, you know, there isn't much difference between you know, uh, the God of the Jews, uh, the God that relates to Christianity and the God that relates to the Islamic world. There might be some of that creeping in, you know. There was a person told me they <laughs> were in a Bible class in a Church of Christ and um, they were discussing, you know, the idea of salvation. And they were discussing, you know, well, do you have to really be, let's say, immersed in Christ? Do you have to be in the church to be saved? Um, or, you know, uh, could, um, um, you know, people outside the church be saved, you know, just being a good person. And one of the elders in the congregation said, well, the question came up with, you know, could a Islamic person be saved? And one of the elders in that congregation said, well, probably if they're a good person. Now, Let's think about that. Um, people are starting to say that, you know, um, God, Allah, same God. Is that right? 
who said no. What's the difference between Allah and the God of heaven? Okay. One's a God of love, the other is a God of vengeance. The God of heaven has a son. Is that right? Obviously. Uh, the God of the Muslims doesn't have a son. Right? So, you know, how, how would, you know, how would that work? How would there be any? Also, God I'm sorry. Say that again. Yeah. Allah doesn't have a son. Why? <laughs> they, they they say Jesus was a prophet, but wasn't the son of God. Um. We're baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, Allah doesn't have a Son and Holy Spirit, you see. I, I raise that issue because um, the, um, the, the Muslim community, the Islamic community, is, is really permeating the social structure uh, of, uh, of this country. Mark? I'd like to ask that elder who said the Muslim could be saved to a good You look um, like you had a... <laughs> I was reading an article. You know, it's been my... As long as I've been studying, anytime God's people interact with some other religious body that's not following the Bible, they, they wind up falling away from it. If they compromise at all, they wind up falling away. I was reading an article in West Virginia. Christian Baptist preacher that went to church where they would use Dr. James Dobson's uh, to cure on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, on marriage in a home or something. And anyway, the, the preacher that went there questioned one of the elders, well, you know, why are you using that material when our brotherhood has good material on the family, you know, the sound brethren. And he said, well, Dr. James Dobson was a Christian. You know, and I, that's, that's, that's what's happening when we compromise. You know, he's a denominational person. He's probably got good morals and he's got good teachings, but he's not a New Testament Christian. So when we compromise anything, we're going to wind up losing. But that's something that we're really facing, not only within Christendom, but among the various world religions, uh, you know, uh, her, her. I think there's a passage of scripture. There are others, but one that will, will settle this thing about who can and cannot be saved. And uh, since I wouldn't be heard if I read, you read, uh, if you will, Second Thessalonians 1 6 through 9. Somebody read that. <laughs> so, what is Second Thessalonians 1 6 through 9?
Okay. Okay, well then, let's, the uh, first part of chapter 16, Isaiah, uh, first, fine. Well, I'm, I'm sure there were some people that did say something, and you know, and contrary to that. But well, um, well, you have to question that now because uh, because of their, you know, what what what, what we said, uh, Don. Okay. Yeah, and, and Nikki, your point is well taken, and and that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, then in verse six. Yeah, at um, Fort Hill, we're changing a, a congregate or a management, a week management because uh, a, a, a management of, of one week because the, the previous congregation, where there was kind of the you know had the bulk of the people coming from, uh, are, are off in left field so. Anyway, let, let's let's go to verse six. And and here God has pronounced judgment on Moab. Now he says in verse six, we have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud, even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath. But he lies, but his lies shall not be so. Now, isn't that an interesting way of introducing this? We have heard. I say we have heard. Well, Isaiah knew, right? But that was just kind of an interesting way of, uh, of introducing this thing. So, let's... He, he uses the word pride, haughtiness... Uh, and wrath, they're all in the same, uh, same sector of scripture. So, how was the pride, arrogance of Moab manifested? What is the ultimate manifestation of pride and arrogance? Now, we understand pride in, in social relationships, right? I mean, I'm better than so-and-so. You know, uh, these 
this race of people is better than another race of people. This economic class of people is better than a, another class. I am totally, uh, you know, in charge, so to speak, the attitude. I'm totally in charge, and everybody is kind of subservient to me. My opinion is better. Um, I am better. We understand that kind of thing. But what is the ultimate, what is ab the absolute ultimate uh, manifestation of pride? Pardon me? Yeah. You hear that? The ultimate manifestation is I don't need God. I don't want God. I'm not going to submit to God. I am an entity unto myself and I don't need this God stuff. Oh, okay. So, so, well, so, so you know, they, a person could believe in God or could have some belief in God um, and, and still, well, let, let's take the, the person that believes in God. Could that person still be, could, could a manifestation of, you know, of their rejection, of, could they still have a manifestation of re re uh, rejection of God? Sure, Satan. Huh? Satan believes in God. Yeah. Uh, but what's the problem there? He's not going to... He's not recognizing he's sovereign. He won't submit. He used, uh, Mark used the word sovereign. Uh, what's that mean? In terms of a person that he's his own authority. Yeah. You know, we have sovereign nation. What, what's it mean to be a sovereign nation? You are an, an, an independent, you use the word independent, a, a nation that's unique, separate, uh, not particularly dependent on uh, its existence. Not, its existence is not dependent on somebody else. When a nation loses its sovereignty, then it, rule, it, it, it then is no longer self-ruled, right? So when a person takes, takes on the attitude of sovereignty, to use your word, um, they don't need any. They don't need a God, right? Yeah. So, so the the it seems to me that there must have been some attempt on part of at least some of the people in 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 Judah and to you know try try to get these these Moabites to recognize the God of Heaven. But they weren't going to do that. They didn't do that. So here in, in this section of, say, 6, verses 6 through 12, I, Isaiah is, is, is identifying what their problem was. Well, their, their problem was pride. Um, their problem was haughtiness. And that led to um, wrath. And as a result of that, therefore shall Moab howl for Moab, and everyone shall howl for the foundations of Kerhareth, shall ye mourn. Surely they are stricken. Well, obviously they are stricken, um, because they, they sought not God. For the fields of Heshbon, Languisheth, and the vine of Sibma, the lords of the heathen, have broken down the principal plants. Therefore they are come even unto Jazer. They wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out, and they are gone over the sea. Now, 
here um, Isaiah is using agricultural uh, analogies here, agricultural terms. Um, uh, and, and so in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, agriculture, when the, when the vines, when, when he talks about the vine, um, in the um, branches are stretched out and so forth. He's talking about a, a um, you know, a, 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 a um, poverty, extreme poverty situation here. There, the, 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 the agricultural economy is going to be gone, in other words, in, in, this, um, in this narrative. Um, and then in, in verse 9, um, therefore I will bewail with the weeping of Jazer. Um, now, Isaiah here is taking this, you know, he's, he's sympathetic. I mean, he's, he weeps for these, these, these distant relatives, uh, the Moabites. Therefore I will bewail, I will cry bitterly with the weeping of Jazer, the son of the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbom, and Eliezeth, for the shouting, for the summer fruits, and for thy harvest is fallen. The summer fruits, uh, you know, and, and gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. Now, the time of harvest in an agricultural community um, was a time of joy, right? Um, all you city folks, or all you people that were raised in the city, uh, all you know, sophisticated city folks, have never, probably never had the experience of the joy of harvest. You know, people in the agricultural community used to get together and, and have a, you know, have a, uh, they, they would <laughs> have cider and, you know, you know the apple harvest. Um, they would come together and make sauerkraut. You know, Harold, did you ever experience that kind of thing? You know, so he, he, he couldn't, couldn't celebrate that way. Um, any, anybody ever, you know, in, in the fall of the year, there was a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of um, uh, family get-togethers in terms of the harvest. Oh, you see, you, you won't, you can't, you can't identify with that, as you city, you city folks couldn't identify with that. Maybe, um, Mark, when you get your farm developed, maybe you'll be able to, you know, ex kind of... Okay, well that's a good thing. Uh, well, anyway, so so there was a in in that in that Jewish community and in, in those communities there was there was kind of there was a there was a uh, joy connected with the harvest. Um, well, he, uh, Isaiah says in verse ten, and the gladness is taken away, and the joy out of the plentiful field. Um, and in the vineyards shall there be no singing. Uh, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders. Treaders? What, what's, that, what's that idea? Treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. Well, Herschel, what's the... Yeah, the treaders. Um, you know, I, I assume they washed their feet or something, but there was, you know, they, <laughs> they were squeezing the, uh, the juice out of the, out of the grapes. Um, wouldn't be any of that kind of stuff. The treaders shall tread out, but there's no wine in their presses. And I have made their vintage shouting to cease. Wherefore my bowels shall sound like a harp for Moab, and mine inward parts for 
Kirsch Harris. Um, the, the harp of Moab apparently, apparently had a, a, a mournful sound. In verse 12, And it shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary in the high place, that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray, but shall not prevail. Now, what was the sanctuary of the Moabites? Was it the temple? Or was it the groves where they had the where they had the um, the the gods? Of the Moabites, the false gods. The groves where they had, um, in, 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 in their particular religious uh, situation, they had uh, prostitution as a part of their religious ritual. Um, they're going to come to Isaiah, the, to their, gro their sanctuary, but um, it shall not do do them any good obviously it wouldn't do them any good um, for this is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning Moab since that time and so it, the, the final judgment it, the, God spoke with finality it, this is it um, Moab is going to be destroyed uh, now various prophets had prophesied about the doom, the destruction, the judgment of Moab. But uh, it, it, there wasn't any, any time put on it. But now Isaiah is saying, this is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning Moab since that time. But now, see, God has spoken about Moab before. But now the Lord hath spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of a hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be con condemned, contempted. With all the great multitude, and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. Now, that idea of three years as the years of a hireling. Now, I wonder what that as a year of a hireling. I wonder what that, why that expression? Does a hireling count <laughs> the number of hours they work? The number of years that they serve? Right? In other words, it's going to be precisely three years. So Isaiah was saying to the, to the world, in exactly three years, Moab is going to be completely destroyed. Now we don't know the time frame exactly in which this prophecy was given, but whatever time frame, it was just going to be three years. Now it might have been the Assyrian the Assyrians they came in and destroyed Moab at about the same time that they were going to try to destroy Jerusalem or it might have been before that time but the word went out to Moab three specific years and there wasn't any guesswork about that it was three specific years well, I guess the uh, time's up. Uh.